Thank you. Uh, so as Chris said, my name's Tim, I work for SUSE, and I'm here to talk about Ruby and Ruby on Rails, uh, which I've been using for about four years or so. And Ruby is a delightful language and Rails is a very powerful framework, it does lots of things for you. But if you need to do something that's a little bit different than a standard web app deployment, if you're, say, packaging a Rails application as a native distro package, um, you can get into trouble and tend to feel kind of trapped or, or bound to specific version dependencies. You can have annoying build and de deployment problems. So I've often found myself feeling like this poor sod, literally tied to the rails, hence the title of my talk. So a little bit of background. Who here is a Ruby developer? One and a half. <laughs> um, Rails? None. Wow, cool. Okay, so these next slides are kind of worthwhile. Um, uh, Ruby, a uh, language created in the mid-90s by a Japanese fellow named Mats, who at the time said that he wanted a scripting language that was more powerful than Perl and more object-oriented than Python. Now, to me, that sounds like a really good way to start a fight, but... <laughs> But this is his stated reason for creating the Ruby language. Then we've got Ruby Gems, which is a, a packaging system for Ruby bits and pieces. Um, you might think of it as being like CPAN for Perl or easy install for the Python package index or node.js is npm thing. And there's rubygems.org um, where all the gems are hosted and there's a command line tool that you run gem install something or other to install that gem on your system or uninstall or list whatever's there. And there's a bunch of other commands for creating your own gems and things. And then we've got Rails, which is a model view controller style web application framework. It's been around since 2004. It does a whole lot of stuff for you. It knows how to talk to SQL databases, um, does form field validation. It will help try to protect you from cross-site worker request forgery and scripting attacks and that sort of thing. And unsurprisingly, it's available as a gem. So you can go gem, install Rails and have it. But on Linux, at least, uh, it's also, because it's a popular thing, it's also available as a native distro package, as an RPM or a deb, which you can go and install using your native distro package, uh, package management tools. So to create a Rails application, again, from your terminal, you go Rails new my app, and that creates a skeleton of a uh, application there, you can start it up, point your web browser at localhost, it goes, hey, Rails, yay. And the interesting thing here is when you run that first command, Rails new my app, um, it invokes this other thing called Bundler to go and download all of the dependencies of your application and install them globally on your system. Um, possibly you don't want to do that. Um, you may not want to clobber whatever's already on your system. Um, and so instead, you can run Rails new my app skip bundle, and it won't do that. And then later, you can go bundle install standalone, and all of your dependencies will be pulled into a subdirectory of your application. They won't be clobbering whatever's on your, your system globally. And actually, balling up all your dependencies like that in a usual deployment scenario where you're, you're developing the web application yourself uh, on your laptop or your desktop or whatever, and then you deploy it hopefully to a dev or test server and not straight into production. And you test it there for a while and when it all works, you push it onto the production system. In that scenario, um, you're the one managing the deployment and maybe you're not the one managing the system you're deploying to. Maybe it's hosted with uh, Engine Yard or something and you actually can't install your dependencies globally on the, the, the system you're deploying to. So Packaging them all up with your application actually kind of makes sense in that scenario. Um, this is all done for you by Bundler. Um, you've either written this thing called a gem file or it's been created automatically uh, when you created your Rails app. And it's actually just Ruby source. And this one here says that we're going to go and get all of our dependencies from rubygems.org. We're using Rails 3.2.12, uh, some version of SQLite 3. Uh, we're using SAS Coffee and Uglifier because we're being fancy and we're using jQuery because jQuery. Now, when you invoke Bundler, uh, or when your application starts up for that matter, because it invokes Bundler then to verify that all your dependencies are there, 
it looks through your gem file, through the dependencies that you know about, and then it looks through all of them and their dependencies, and it generates this big dependency tree. Um, and you'll notice some of these things have very specific versions in there, and some of them are a little bit fuzzy. Um, these are the versions of all of the dependencies that were available on the system that you were doing your development on. Um, your application will only run if these dependencies are present. If those versions don't match on your deployment system, your application will go clunk. It just won't start. Um, but again, uh, in that traditional deployment scenario I mentioned, where you might not be controlling the server that you're deploying on, uh, the base operating system can change and your application keeps running because you've balled all that stuff in, up inside. So if you're running the deployment, that if you're keeping an eye on security updates for all your dependencies, if you're continually redeploying your application, uh, that's actually okay. But if you're trying to do something a little bit different, like take a Rails app and then package it up as an RPM or a DEB so that somebody else can go and install that themselves on their own Linux system, um, it's a bit annoying. Uh, in my case, I'm doing exactly that. I have a, uh, an application called Hawk, which stands for High Availability Web Console. We ship this on SUSE Linux, and I've got builds for Fedora, and somebody made an Ubuntu one a while ago. Um, this is a management and monitoring tool for pacemaker high availability clusters, which just happens to be implemented as a Rails app. My users shouldn't care that it happens to be a Rails app. They shouldn't have to go and clone my source tree and run Bundler and install things. Um, they should be able to take my RPM, which is the Rails app and a few C binaries and a lighty config file and an init script, and just install that themselves and all of the nodes in their cluster and then just use it to monitor <coughs> their cluster. It's not that people who run HA clusters aren't smart and couldn't go and do all that stuff, but, but they shouldn't have to, and they probably don't want to. So the question is, if I've used Bundler to pack all the dependencies up into my application and then I've turned that into an RPM, um, what do I do about security updates? If there's a security update to Rails, I have to ship a new Hawk RPM, even if I haven't added any new functionality. And we have the same problem with a few other applications that we ship on SUSE Linux as RPMs. We've already got Rails as an RPM itself separately, we should just be able to ship new Rails RPMs and have our applications use it. It's um, packaging everything up into individual uh, apps like that, it, it's crazy. We don't statically link, link all of our C applications, we have shared libraries for that. Um, we should just be able to ship an updated Rails package and have it all just work. So, <clears throat> um, I know I'm not a stereotypical web developer responsible for doing the deployment myself, but um, how did we end up thinking that going back to the bad old days before dynamic, link, uh, dynamic libraries was a good idea as applied to Rails and Bundler? I, I do get binding to a major version, but binding hard to a minor version or a point release is like, why does Bundler think this is a good idea? And I was thinking about this late, late one night, and I thought maybe it's because uh, we've forgotten, or worse yet, possibly never learned an important lesson. Um, this is John Postel, um, without whom the internet wouldn't be what it is today. He was the editor of the RFC document series from 1969 until his death in 1998. He administered um, IANA until his death. Um, he wrote and co-authored more than 200 RFCs, including the ones that define the internet protocol, so he's sort of important. Um, <laughs> and there's a quote that he's particularly famous for, which is, be liberal in what you accept and conservative in what you send. And this was written in the context of network protocols, but I think that this can be broadly applied to many fields of endeavor. Um, but I'm not here for social commentary, so I'll stick to the Ruby and Rails thing. If Bundler was adhering to this philosophy, it would make gemfile.log kind of fuzzy by default, or maybe it wouldn't include versions at all. It would just be a dependency tree. Um, if, if people developing gems themselves were adhering to this philosophy, they'd be taking great care to ensure API stability so that Bundler wouldn't need to be so paranoid. And some of them are. Some people are doing a great job, but some of them aren't. They're just going, I really want version 3.5.1 of this thing. And, you know. um, I know that it's possible to deliberately specify fuzzy versions in your gem spec file, so if more people were doing that, it would make things a bit easier.
Now I have to digress slightly into how software is installed, which will hopefully explain why I like distro packages as opposed to any other means of installing software. Who here has seen this or something like it recommended as a way of installing software? OK. Um, every time you do this, someone on a security team somewhere, someone whose job it is to ensure that the software that we use is free from exploits, one of those people throws up their hands in despair. They throw all of their com computer equipment out the window. It smashes into a pile of rubble on their driveway, and they give up, and they go and live in the hills. <laughs> yes? Who's, who's, doing it right now? <laughs> who's doing it right now? Who just wrote that down? <laughs> what? Who just wrote that, that down? Tim already lives on a hill. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's, I'm actually not a security professional. This actually isn't me, but it, um, I need more tattoos and a gun. Uh, logic, anyway. Um, the, the problem with that command is that you're um, downloading something and just running it straight into a root shell. Um, there could be DNS page poisoning going on, a hacked router, a transparent proxy, something that gives a man in the middle attack so you're not downloading what you think you um, were meant to be getting. The server could have been compromised, so even if you are pulling something from where you think you're, uh, from where you're meant to be getting it from, you're not getting what you want. Um, and uh, it, it, it's not an uncommonly suggested technique. Uh, this appeared on uh, the Rackspace blog. I don't want to pick on Rackspace because they're a really great company, and I, there's, I know lots of people who work for them. But um, there was a blog post where they suggested that to install Rails on macOS, you should run Ruby and have it evaluate um, this thing that curl has just pulled straight out of GitHub. And just, no. <laughs> um, so getting away from that holy terror, um, is Ruby gems any better? Um, kinda, because um, you're getting things from one place, but not really. Because um, at the Ruby Nation conference a while ago, um, a guy called Ben Smith gave a talk called Hacking with Gems not hacking gems, but hacking with gems and using gems as an attack vector. He handed out these cards and 10% of the attendees um, went home and ran this command. Um, and the, uh, the important thing to note is what this gem didn't do. It didn't steal anybody's passwords or add secret SSH keys to anybody's systems, um, but it could have. Um, and um, Tom, I think, mentioned to me at one point that it's not just... Um, uh, Ruby, uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss at PyCon um, AU did the same thing, called it Pyth uh, Python Nation, effectively. So um, these language-specific uh, 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 packaging things might be okay for developers, kind of, but I don't really want to force this on um, my end users. Um, and also, the RubyGem server suffered from that YAML exploit that Tom was just talking about um, earlier last year, and there was malicious code put up there. So. Um, if you're using distro packages, uh, an RPM or a DEB or whatever, they're signed by your distro uh, maintainers. Um, it's been through one extra level of packaging, another level of QA. Depending on your distro, it might be well supported. The people doing the maintenance of it are probably working closely with upstream. Um, and so distro packages give you one more level of testing and validation and trust. And this is why I would far rather install them than anything else. Back to Rails apps. Um, Your distro, your Linux distro, will have packaged some gems as RPMs or DEBs. Um, but we can still be screwed by bundler and gemfile.log. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Adam, put together this wiki page uh, discussing strategies for packaging uh, gems as RPMs and for packaging applications, um, uh, packaging Rails applications as RPMs as well. And um, the, there's a whole lot of stuff in there, so you should look at that if you're interested in the, in the big story. But the thing that I wanted to focus on was strategies for dealing with gemfile.lock, which ties your application to particular versions of, it, of its dependencies. The first two I'm going to kind of skim over, because they're fine for developers, but they don't help end users. And that is to <coughs> keep your gemfile.lock checked into your source repo. Um, this can actually be good for developers because you know that you're testing against a particular set of dependencies that you're happy with right now. 
Um, but you're bound to the dependencies on the development system, so your end users are still screwed. Multiple copies checked into a source repo with different sets of versions is interesting. If you're having multiple teams working on the same project on possibly different target distributions, um, but again, it's completely useless at the um, uh, end user point. Slightly more interesting is if you generate the gemfile.lock when you're building your RPM or your deb package, because that usually happens in a, uh, a clean Cheroot environment, which matches exactly what your target operating system will be, at least when the target operating system is released for the first time. But if somebody goes and updates, say, Rails on the target operating system and your application has a hard dependencies on, dependency on Rails 3.2.12 and a security update comes out for Rails and it's updated to 3.2.13, your application suddenly stops working because 3.2.12 isn't there anymore. So that doesn't quite get us there. Um, another strategy was to automatically generate gemfile.lock when the application runs. And this means that your application binds to whatever dependencies are present on the target system at runtime, but it also means that your init script or whatever it is that starts your application up has to delete the gemfile.lock every time it runs before it runs the application, which seems kind of messy to me. Uh, so what I did for Hawk is I just deleted the damn thing. Um, gemfile and gemfile.lock are gone from my RPM. Um, I'm only using distro package gems that have, have become RPMs as my dependencies. Um, uh, I just said I'm not packaging gemfile.lock or gemfile. All of my dependencies are in my RPM spec file, so my regular package management tools pull in all of the pieces that I need. And I've also had to make a little change to one of the files in my Rails app, config boot.rb, which runs early on when your app starts up. So my, my gem file now um, looks like this. I've got, uh, I need Rails, uh, that little squiggly greater than thing means I need Rails greater than 3.2 but less than 4, so that's a nice broad range to work with. I need any version of fast get text um, and something better than 043 of, fast, of get text internationalization Rails. These other two groups here, the development group and the test group, the next one, I should have asked, can everybody see that? Yeah. Good. Um, uh, development and test, uh, a Rails app can run in a few different modes. When it's running in production mode, it, it uses um, the things that aren't in any group and anything that's specifically in production. Um, if you're running it in development or test, interestingly, I've got my GitHub repo hooked up to Travis CI to, do, to run tests every time I do a commit. So in this case, when it's running um, uh, in test mode, it will actually go out to rubygems.org to pull in its dependencies, but that only happens during development or during continuous integration testing. This is something that end users never have to see or care about. The change that I had to make to um, my config boot.rb is usually this just consists of a line that says require bundler slash setup. So when your app runs, bundler fires up, looks at the gem file, does its magic. Um, in my case, I had to change this so that if the gem file exists, which it will during development um, and testing, use Bundler, that's fine. Um, otherwise, I have to manually require those three gems, which are also listed in my gem file. That's a little bit of, I'm breaking a rule there, um, don't repeat yourself is one of those things. Um, in this case, I don't care because I've deliberately got a very short list of dependencies um, and I don't mind that little bit of duplication to give me to remove the problems that I would have at deployment time otherwise. Um, so uh, what does this all give me? Um, it means that I'm using Bundler exactly when I want to use it during development and testing. Um, it means that I am using distro supplied dependencies at runtime. I have no hard runtime version binding at all. Um, dependency security updates work. Um, because of that, that hard binding has gone away, so we can ship a new Rails package and the application will just use it. Um, but I've deliberately been very conservative in, in the set of, uh, uh, in my specific set of dependencies, partly because the more dependencies I have, the more stuff that we actually have to support. Um, so, and that, that's a, uh, uh, we have to be very, um, what's the word, judicious? sensible about 
what packages we include in the distro because we have to stand behind this and go, yes, we're happy to run this stuff, you know. Um, so this works in my case. Um, this approach may or may not work um, for other larger applications with more complicated sets of, I mean, it will still work. It just becomes more annoying to maintain a couple of lists of things. Um, so, for the one and a half people who may actually have benefited from the, <laughs> um, uh, from the Ruby and Rails specific stuff, I hope I've given, no, one of them's gone. There's only half a person left. Um, I, I hope I've given you um, <laughs> um, some things to think about and some possible solutions uh, if you're trying to distribute packaged Rails apps. Um, and for everybody else, um, the thought that I'd like to finish with is there is no spoon. Um, no, hang on. <laughs> there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. <coughs> Which is not quite it either. Um, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. Um, actually, I, I, I think it's all of these things. And what these... What these three disparate quotes say to me is that the world is a really weird place. And the software development world, I don't think, is, any, is an exception to this at all. Um, so hopefully, I've gotten people thinking a bit about how there's more than one deployment environment, and there's more than one type of developer, and more than one type of user. Um, and that all of these different <coughs> people and environments, they all work a bit differently, and they have different needs, and different requirements, and different assumptions. And if we can remember this, and to borrow uh, John's quote again, be, try to be liberal in what we accept and conservative in what we send, I think that we can all create better, more reliable software that's easier to deploy. Um, and with that, thank you for your time. Yes. Yeah. The, the question was why, why why are the versions so um, specific, and is it because things are moving so quickly? Um, but we can't, uh, try to uh, maintain an interface and then yeah. uh, change the implementation behind it. My, my question, is, um, as Zane said, it's because it's Ruby. Um, my, um, it's because it's, look. It's, I, I think it's a. I think it's a, a, a possibly a, a, a subcultural or cultural thing in particular. Uh, uh, development, what do you, it's not an environment. Um, I can't use ecosystem because Florian will hit me. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think that what happens is somebody makes a cool toy, right? And they stick it up on GitHub and their cool toy is nice because you just want to make a cool toy and it does these cool things. And then um, when you're doing that, you haven't necessarily thought very well about API design um, much or at all. Um, and then you've published this thing, and if it's sufficiently cool, somebody else has gone and started using it. And then later on, when you go back to the cool thing that you were building, you realize it's a complete pile of shit, and you have to rewrite the whole thing and actually put an API on it, but you can't now because there's all these other developers who are using your cool thing version one. And because of that style of development, all of those other developers over there suddenly become very, very paranoid about... Um, uh, unstable or non-existent APIs and things breaking, hence the, the, the hard version dependency. Just, just, just on that topic, there's also the software as, soft, software as a service developer culture. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's very much move fast and break things. Um, and it's because they're building for a single production deployment yes. of their application, and they're just publishing things kind of incidentally, it's, it's, they're not publishing them as we're doing this to support our users, but they're publishing it because they can, which is cool. Yeah. But they don't have that culture of you are publishing an API, you now have a responsibility to make st maintain stability of that API. Well, you shouldn't use Rails. <laughs> <laughs> but more, more often than, more than, than not, you'll find that a lot of those stems, should that find this, their way into more common usage, that over time, those strict dependencies become more flexible yeah. Yeah, as they become yeah, more, as they become more, more mature. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, the rails is rails by rails. Um, has actually done a reasonably good job over um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. All sorts of things break if you port from Rails 2 to Rails 3, but Rails 2 dot whatever, um, the APIs didn't change that much or things were being deprecated slowly. Or, and the, 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 so Rails qua Rails was being quite sensible about this. But there's so many other bits and pieces in that, that gem ecosystem, sorry Florian. Um, he hates that term. Um, uh, there's so many other bits and pieces for which that isn't true, where, where people haven't actually done their APIs properly or tried to maintain stability or, or whatever. Um, uh, yep. Um, have you heard of RBN? RBN. Yes. Um, it's on GitHub, a good called SD. I used it a bit when you go back through the work. It allows to run different versions of GET and then different versions of Ruby from like your own directory, basically. Uh, so what it's going to bring, 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 I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't used that um, because, again, I have a slightly different deployment scenario than the thing that I manage. I have a, a, a Linux distribution that I have to support with particular versions of things, uh, with, sorry, a, a, a stable series of applications for a long time. Um, and this is um, going, back, going back to your point before. Um, that's a completely different model than uh, just keep deploying until it works, right? Um, so. Uh, I'll, I'll just ask perspective. I mean, looking at the packaging from like, Ruby and, and Ruby and Rails, one of the things that frustrated me going from system into software engineering has been the distros repackaging wanting to repackage Rails and its you know, associated dependencies because they're so often vastly out of date. You know, it's just not just even the LTS, but even just the you know, rolling <coughs> pieces. Um, your thoughts in, on that? Uh, um, okay, so the, the, the question was, uh, what are my thoughts on distro packages lagging behind um, whatever the, the native uh, language package system does? Um, that's, um, we're all screwed. Um, <laughs> um, it's, it's going to be a problem because of, um, uh, of all of the things that are available in a native, uh, native language package management system. No distro will ever pick up all of these. They'll pick up the ones that that distro wants to support and make readily available through the distro package management tools. Um, and you get the advantage of distro packages and trust that I was talking about before, but you lose the bleeding edge and you also, um, if you're writing an application that has intersections between what's been natively packaged and what's language packaged, um, if I can confuse everybody by mixing my terms up, um, you get into trouble. Um, I, don't, um, I don't have a good answer for that, um, other than that um, if, you, if you, sorry? If all of seen people are interested in this stuff, uh, it affects the Python community as well. And yeah. there's a talk in the May conference on Thursday, which is about the Python uh, attempting to deal with this in the Python space. Who's leaving it, Nick Coughlin? I don't know. <laughs> Who could that possibly be? <laughs> but surely to this point, anyways, is even if you take the distro out of it. The fact that you're bundling stuff up to incredibly, incredibly specific versions, and that every app has its own incredibly specific version, but that, that, and you completely lose sight of security patching, or you have apps that but there's, there's a culture saying, well, I'm going to opt to this old version that you can't patch for security. Uh, that, and that's a cultural problem yeah. with some of the upstream packaging yeah. communities, and yeah. without. Uh, anyway, yeah, there's that. <laughs> but the distro yes. piece of that is kind of a recurring to Tim's main point. Uh, so, it's a problem that needs to be fixed upstream. Yeah. The distro can't solve it. Upstream has to fix it. And I think we're pretty much out of time. So, everybody, please thank you.